Well, welcome, everyone. Great to see you here tonight to our first Humanum Lecture. Let us say a few words about Humanum Review before we introduce tonight's speaker. I am Margaret McCarthy, editor of Humanum. With me are Agata Rotkamp, managing editor David Henderson, editor of Art Artifact, our arts column, and Jeannie Schindler will be here. She is also an assistant editor. Humanum Review is the journal of the John Paul II Institute. It was founded by our late and beloved David L. Schindler together with Stratford Caldecott, also late and beloved. David was the editor of the North American edition of Communio and dean of the John Paul II Institute. Stratford was his great friend and like David, a teacher to many of us. A Catholic convert, Strat was a publisher, editor and author. He was an expert on Tolkien and Chesterton and the Avengers too. When he was struck early with a terminal disease, he was editing and writing for Humanum from his bed. His wife, Leonie, who was every bit his intellectual partner, helped him and then remained with us as UK editor until she retired. What is this journal so important to figures like Schindler and Caldecott about? Humanum is about the human, what makes us human, what keeps us human, and what does not. Why about the human? What can be more interesting to us than to know who we are and be that more fully? We love our human condition, our existence in the body, in time and space, falling in love, marrying, begetting, raising children, watching their first steps, eating together at the table, working for a living and for the good of the world, celebrating, singing, dancing, and so on. But we also hate our human condition. It is dramatic. Faced with its limits, one's own mother and father, one's own husband or wife, one's own children, then one's own body. We would rather improve our, in our condition by becoming something else. We would be gods. The story is an old one, but recent developments in our technical capacity to manipulate our condition at the level of its very conception and now the condition of its very possibility, the sex distinction itself, show how close we are coming to deciding for ourselves what we shall be. Sounding the alarm in one of his last speeches as Pope, Benedict XVI said, the very notion of what being human really means is being called into question. Man calls his nature into question. From now on, he is merely spirit and will. The manipulation of nature, which we deplore today, where our environment is concerned, now becomes man's fundamental choice, where he himself is concerned. For from now on, there is only the abstract human being who chooses for himself what his nature is to be. The key figures of human existence vanish, mother, father, child. Essential elements of the experience of being human are lost. The long prophesied uh, abolition of man is at hand, but the outcome is not as liberating as it was supposed to be. As Lewis predicted, if man treats himself as raw material, raw material he will be, but not for himself as he fondly imagined, but for his conditioners. We know these conditioners. They are the ones in the labs designing humans, in the clinics selecting the better ones, the ones in schools in library story hours, doctor's offices and social media, counseling confused children to be something else. They are the ones running hospitals and drug companies who will make their living off of them. They are the algorithms that tell us what to think. They are the avatars and an artificial intelligence that would replace our thinking altogether. In short, we are improving ourselves at the cost of our very selves. We are becoming liquidated. Believers have recently found themselves in a new position, a lonely one. They are now the last custodians and defenders of things that are there for all to see. Before, they were mostly the custodians of the truths that came by way of revelation. But now they are also and especially the custodians of the truth about the natural order staring us in the face. It is not only the resurrection of the body they believe in, but the body that will be resurrected. And now that, too, is a matter of religious fanaticism. Chesterton predicted this over 100 years ago. Everything will be denied. 
everything will become a creed. It will be reasonable to deny the stones in the street. It will be a religious dogma to assert them. Swords will be drawn to prove that leaves are green in summer. We shall be left defending this universe which stares us in the face. We shall fight for visible prodigies as if they were invisible. We shall look on the grass in the skies with a strange courage. We shall be those who have seen and yet believed. But this is as it should be, for it is not possible to sustain an acceptance of our condition without God. The God who created the world and its flesh, the not God, who declared it good, who then entered it, bringing new life into its unbearable limits, who then rose with it to the point that we could become God while never ceasing to remain man. Without God, on the contrary, the only possible outcome is an upside-down existence, as Ratzinger said. Quote, images, outward appearances, and current opinion have dominion over man, over every sphere of his life. That which is against nature becomes the norm. Man's creativity is no longer at the service of the good. He devotes his genius to ever more refined forms of evil. The bonds between man and woman and between parents and children are dissolved so that the very sources from which life springs are blocked up. It is no longer life that reigns, but death. A civilization of death is formed. Now more than ever then, it should be clear that, to quote him again, whoever defends God is defending man. And this is why humanum exists, to defend our human common humanity by keeping ourselves awake to God. So now uh, I'm going to invite up Agata, our managing editor, to show us a little bit about how we do this. It is such a delight to be with actual people. With an online publication, you know, we put these things out and everything, and we are glad that you are in captive audience who will listen to me for two, three minutes just to show you how humanum works. So. Um, when you land on our, our homepage, the most recent article will be there. We put out one article um, a week. That is always our goal. And this is a great article by Mark Barnes, by the way, if you get a chance to read it. And underneath are the three most recent ones. So just at the click of a button, basically what we have published in the last month uh, is right there. And you know our subtitle being Issues in Family, Culture, and Science. It's, it's all very different things. But I think what really sets us apart is that these are not just random articles. We really uh, want to sustain a reflection, to, to have some uh, depth. So we actually uh, bind, in a way, all uh, eight to 12 articles with a given theme. They are uh, come together as an issue, and that's also on our homepage. And as you can see, that's a current issue in progress. And once, it, once it's complete, this is kind of what it looks like. You can look at the index. Different types of articles, resource is kind of us, you know, uh, gathering the great minds on a given theme and, and seeing what they have to say about a given topic. Feature articles are more sustained reflections. Witness pieces are just lovely to read or personal uh, experiences that people kind of convey. So just an example, an Italian initiative by Marcus Sermarini, he's talking about starting the, the Chesterton schools and what that was like in his experience. And then book reviews, and those are always of nonfiction works. And um, Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but I might as well tell you. So the issue is not where it ends. We actually think on a big scale. We always start with a big theme. So for example, here the theme was education, and we broke it down into four different aspects. So first steps being childhood, what does education mean? The second being reading, writing, arithmetic, and the index for that is what we just saw on the last slide right here. Uh, education of the sexes, so sex education, education and technology. So this, there's a whole bunch of articles here. They're all about education, but different facets. We've also done language, the body, you know, different aspects of that huge theme, health and medicine. Um, and that's just kind of the beginning. The good news is these are all accessible. If you go on our homepage, I did a big fat arrow so you can't miss it. If you click on annual themes, every single one of our articles that we've ever published is there. And if you subscribe to Humanum, you're going to get, you will not be inundated, you know, once uh, a month you will get a digest with our four newest articles. Um, and you're going to hear from the likes of um, uh, Rolling Stone contributor John Waters. Um, 
Mark Milos, Chief of Staff at the Tom Lantos Commission for International Human Rights. These are some of our past contributors. Carlo Galda, who is here in the audience, and she is the editor for um, National Book Club Bel Ramon, but we had her first. Uh, finance reporter for Reuters, Edward Hadass, um, Mark Barnes, New Polity editor, Sally Reed, award-winning poet. So all sorts of people, you know, from different, whatever theme we're treating, we try to find the experts or people who are interested or interesting, um, both. So you can subscribe just on our website at any point from your phone, laptop, or you can um, use, we have uh, clipboards just with paper. If you just need your email address, we will not pass it on, and you hear from us once a month. So that's kind of the, the ins and outs of Humanum. I'm just going to invite uh, my colleague, David Henderson, who will tell you about another Humanum initiative. Hi, pleasure to be uh, here with you all tonight. Uh, so glad to see so many faces. As again, I got to reiterate it, we don't actually get to see many faces uh, working for Humanum uh, Review. Uh, I am the organizing editor for um, what I guess is traditionally a column, um, but is a subsection of our website, uh, Artifact, which uh, on the previous slide you'll, you'll notice was called Artifact, uh, Film and Fiction. Uh, I'm happy to announce we've expanded um, that uh, platform uh, this year uh, to include materials on music, uh, poetry, uh, fine arts, theater, uh, and building into uh, this development of our commitment uh, to the arts just to communicate a little bit about uh, what it is that we see in this, uh, in this project at Humanum. Uh, when I think of artifact, I think of uh, the comment made by the late Catholic philosopher uh, Roger Scruton, who once commented that the distinguishing feature of the great artists of the past was their shared awareness that in response to the chaos and suffering of life, that art, and specifically beauty, has a purpose, has a mission. It brings consolation and shows that human life is still worthwhile. At Artifact, we turn the spotlight on mundane cultural objects, um, from television shows to anime uh, to horror flicks. Um, and we do so with the purpose of not just reminding artists and the art itself, but also reminding ourselves of this sacred mission. Um, that at the heart of our exploration of art lies deep questions as to what it means to be human, who is God, what is the meaning of my existence, and how it all fits together. Um, so again, we're happy to announce this year our continued commitment to developing uh, Artifact. You'll see more Artifact in the future as we develop this, uh, uh, this initiative. Um, and in many respects, our event tonight is uh, a continuation, an extension of that uh, same uh, that same vision and purpose. Uh, and it's my honor uh, to uh, uh, introduce our feature uh, presenter for tonight, Dr. Sarah Bond. Dr. Sarah Bond is an art historian, an independent scholar with a PhD in medieval art from Harvard University. And among her fields of expertise are art history, medieval art, and the artwork in the, in the churches in the Chicago area, as well as at the Art Institute of Chicago. Her dissertation on French Romanesque sculpture drew, drove an interest in the art of, ch of churches and the meaning of sacred spaces. And in this field, she has taught as an adjunct professor at DePaul University, designed church tours, lectured, and written a booklet on the modern church of St. Thomas the Apostle in Hyde Park. And in the more general field of sacred art, Sarah has designed thematic courses on Christianity and art, which he offers to parishes and congregations in the Chicago area. A primary focus of Sarah's work is the collections of the Art Institute of Chicago, which I'm told will feature very prominently tonight, and where she curates tours for college cl classes, arts groups, and private clients. Sarah also gives online presentations for context travel, exploring works at the Art Institute and at museums, across the country. And on a personal note, Sarah and her husband, Doug, live in Chicago and have three children and two grandchildren. Join me with a warm welcome uh, for our feature presenter tonight, Dr. Sarah Bond.
Okay, is this good sound? Good evening, everyone. Thank you to Dr. McCarthy and all the editors of Humanum for the invitation to speak in celebration of the journal. I'm really honored to be, to be here. Humanum, according to its mission statement, is about the human. So it's fitting that we take as our subject the human figure in art. The human figure is central to the history of art, and how artists depict the human body tells us a lot about their culture's view of the human being in the world. For much of Western art, mastery in the depiction of the human body has been required of artists and the measure of their greatness. But how do artists depict the inner aspects of the person? Emotions, spirit, ecstasy, suffering. It is this question that we will explore this evening. We will look in detail at several works by El Greco, studying the poses, gestures, and visual qualities of particular figures. Jumping back in time, we'll look at El Greco's roots in Byzantine and medieval figural art. And finally, we'll turn to two modern masters of the expressive human figure, Rodin and Picasso, both of whom were influenced by El Greco and both of whom depicted spiritualized figures in a secular context. Let's begin with one of my favorite paintings at the Art Institute of Chicago, El Greco's St. Martin and the Beggar of 1597 to 99. In this splendid painting, El Greco depicts the well-known event in the life of St. Martin when he divides his cloak and gives half of it to a beggar. The painting, which measures about 43 by 25, is a smaller version of an original, which is in the collection of the National Gallery of Art right here in DC. This is, this is, um, still the Chicago version, and here's the, you probably can't tell them apart, which is, which is fine. <laughs> the original, uh, this is just bigger, but we'll, the original was commissioned for the chapel of St. Joseph in Toledo, Spain, where El Greco had settled 20 years earlier. This is a comparison. I tried to get them roughly in the correct ratio, so the, the National Gallery version is, is on your right and is, is the original. The chapel had been founded by a wealthy philanthropist named Martin Ramirez for Teresa of Avila and her newly founded order of the Discalced Carmelites. But after Ramirez's death in 1568, his heirs turned the structure into a family burial chapel. The subjects chosen and carried out by El Greco reflect the spirituality of St. Teresa and at the same time honor Ramirez. At the center, over the main altar, was the painting St. Joseph and the Infant Christ with the coronation of the Virgin above it. Um, and I'm gonna move on from this slide, so I just wanna point out while we have it. So here's the central painting, and the St. Martin and the Beggar was over here, and of course isn't there anymore, and then the, an another painting I'll show you was over here. Over the left-hand side altar was our painting St. Martin and the Beggar, And here's a close-up of the St. Joseph and the Infant Christ. And over the right-hand side altar was the Virgin and Child with St. Tecla, or sometimes thought to be St. Martina, and Agnes. And this is also at the National Gallery of Art in DC, just by chance. The theme of St. Martin and the Beggar highlights Ramirez's patron saint, Martin, represents the virtue of charity, and honors Ramirez's lifelong devotion to helping the poor. His tomb was placed just next to El Greco's painting. So how has El Greco interpreted this familiar scene from the life of St. Martin? In a canvas almost twice as tall as it is wide, El Greco places St. Martin, his horse, and the beggar in a tightly packed composition. The vantage point is from below, so the tall, slender figure of St. Martin towers above us. Martin was a soldier in the Roman army during the fourth century but El Greco depicts him in the contemporary dress of 16th century Toledo. His armor is gold damascened, a technique for which Toledo was internationally renowned. His white ruff and purple padded hose were typical of contemporary fashion. His emerald green cloak, which has fallen off his shoulders and is draped over the horse, is made of a rich velvety fabric. With one hand, Martin holds the rein of his horse, while with the other, he raises his sword to cut the cloak in half. 
His expression is impassive, conveying calmness and nobility, but also following the medieval artistic conventions in which emotion is expressed through narrative and gesture rather than facial expression. Dominating the scene is St. Martin's glistening white steed. El Greco reserved the brightest white tones for the front of the horse, and he stands out against the dark background. The deep black of his harness and bridle provides a sharp contrast. Depicted in three-quarter profile and strongly foreshortened, the horse projects forward, raising his front hoof as if about to step out of the picture. Compressed into a tight space on the left side of the canvas is the beggar, who is already holding on to St. Martin's cloak with one hand. The beggar is nude, covered only by one end of Martin's cloak and a ragged white cloth that is just visible under the cloak. Wounds on his lower leg are barely covered by a white bandage. His body is emaciated and he turns toward Martin with a similar serene gaze, his face in full profile. The beggar's darker skin tone and shortly cropped hair suggest that he is Moorish or of North African descent, another way El Greco gives the story a contemporary cast. The scene takes place on a high ledge overlooking the city of Toledo, which stands in for the original location of Amiens. El Greco depicts Toledo as it looked in his day, including the Tagus River, the Alcantara Bridge, and the water wheel, which brought water from the river to the upper parts of the city. The ethereal light in the distant parts of the city and the dramatic colors of the sky make the whole landscape appear transfigured, as if to reflect the momentous event that is taking place. But what is momentous about this simple act of charity? Let's remember the details of this episode in the life of the early Christian saint. Martin, who was forced by his father to join the Roman army, was stationed in France. Riding along the road near Amiens, he met a beggar who was scantily clad and freezing from the cold. Martin took his sword and divided his military cloak in two, giving half to the beggar. That night, Christ appeared to Martin in a dream, saying, what you have done for that poor man, you have done for me. In the dream, Christ was wearing the half cloak. The episode then reveals a fundamental teaching of Christianity, which is that Christ appears to us in the least of these. What is momentous about this episode is that it represents an encounter with Christ. This gives rise to the question, how did El Greco show us that the figure of the beggar is also Christ? El Greco's beggar is a striking figure, at once realistic and distorted. His body is stretched and attenuated to an unnatural degree, especially in the torso and right arm. Shadows delineate bones and muscles, but the body does not appear substantial. This effect is heightened by the beggar's awkward pose, which appears slightly off balance. The undulating outline of the figure echoes the outlines of the horse's legs and creates an abstract effect. With these features, El Greco suggests that there is something beyond the natural about this figure. The beggar is reminiscent of the holy figures in Byzantine icons, familiar to El Greco from his early training as an icon painter, which lessened the corporeality of the body in order to accentuate its spirituality. But what is specifically Christ-like about the beggar? Perhaps the way the ribs and stomach are delineated are meant to suggest the crucified Christ? And there's the hint of Christ's loincloth beneath the cloak. I don't know if you can see that, but right, right there. But most suggestive is the beggar's pointing finger. This gesture is accentuated by the darkening of the green cloak behind the hand, especially in the Chicago version of the painting. The pointing finger would be quite familiar to El Greco as the medieval speaking gesture, commonly used to denote a holy figure. He depicted Christ with this gesture in his painting of the resurrection from 1597 to 1600. And in a rare sculpture of the risen Christ, almost contemporary with St. Martin and the beggar, which El Greco made as part of his last commission for a hospital chapel. In the sculpture in particular, Christ's pointing hand is almost identical to the beggars in the painting. With this gesture, El Greco taps into the tr tradition of Christian sacred art and its ways of signifying. 
Setting the scene in contemporary Toledo, he gives the act of charity a universal significance. I'd like to turn now to another El Greco painting, also in the collection of the National Gallery, Laocoon. Painted between 1610 and 1614. Laocoon depicts a subject from classical mythology, something rare for El Greco. Let's get the full picture. As there is no known commission for the painting, and it was listed in the inventory of his possessions at his death, El Greco likely painted this for personal artistic reasons, whether he intended it for sale or not. The painting depicts an episode rec recounted in Virgil's Aeneid that is part of the story of the Trojan War. Laocoon was a priest of the sea god Neptune in the ancient city of Troy. When the giant wooden horse was sent by the Greeks to Troy, supposedly as a thank offering to the goddess Minerva, Athena in Greek myth, Laocoon was suspicious. As the horse sat outside the gates of the city, Laocoon warned the Trojans of the Greeks' treachery and told them to destroy the horse. But in order to silence Laocoon, Minerva sent two giant serpents from the sea to kill Laocoon and his two sons. The Trojans then pulled the horse into the city, and the Greek soldiers hidden inside emerged and opened the gates of the city to the Greek armies, who laid waste to Troy. From Virgil's time onwards, Laocoon was viewed as a heroic figure. Like a prophet, he warned the city, but his words went unheeded. He was killed and the city destroyed. Virgil dramatically describes the death of Laocoon, and this is quoting from the Aeneid. Two giant arching sea snakes swam over the cal calm waters from Tenedos, breasting the sea together and plunging toward the land. Their four parts and their blood-red crests towered above the waves. The rest drove through the ocean behind, wreathing monstrous coils and leaving a wake that roared and foamed. And now, with blazing and bloodshot eyes and tongues which flickered and licked their hissing mouths, they were on the beach. We paled at the sight and scattered. They forged on straight at Laocoon. First, each snake took one of his two little sons, twined round him, tightening, and bit and devoured the tiny limbs. Next, they seized Laocoon, who had armed himself and was hastening to the rescue. They bound him in the giant spirals of their scaly length, twice round his middle, twice round his throat, and still their heads and necks towered above him. His hands stove frantically to wrench the knots apart. Filth and black venom drenched his priestly hands. His shrieks were horrible and filled the sky, like a bull's bellow when an ax has struck a rye, and he flings it off his neck and gallops wounded from the altar. The pair of serpents now made their retreat sliding up to the temple of heartless Minerva, high on her citadel. Speaking of horror movies, <laughs> sounds really, <laughs> sounds awful. Um, the story of Laocoon gave El Greco the opportunity to reimagine an ancient subject with his original sensibility. The canvas is filled with figures who speak through their expressive poses and gestures. Laocoon is at the center, writhing on the ground, entangled with a snake who is about to bite his head. Scholars have connected Laocoon's pose with the ancient sculpture of the falling Gaul from the second century, which El Greco would have known from his time in Venice. To the right of Laocoon lies one of his sons, already dead. This beautifully rendered figure shows El Greco's skill in foreshortening as he shows the length of the body head on. On the right side of the painting are three mysterious figures who have never been securely identified. Scholars believe that the rear figure was not meant to be seen at all, but was painted over by El Greco. It was only revealed in an overzealous cleaning of the painting in 1955. So I think we can imagine there are two figures. But. There have been different theories about the two remaining figures, but it seems likely that they are gods overlooking the unfolding events. Whoever they are, they view the scene calmly, and, and one even looks away, as if unaffected by the suffering before them. Laocoon's second son appears at the far left of the painting. El Greco accentuates this figure by separating him from the others and by his dramatic pose. 
He has the thin, attenuated body of the beggar in the St. Martin painting, with the same undulating contours. He stretches and looks upward as if begging heaven to rescue him. With outstretched arms, he tries to hold at bay the snake, which is about to bite him in the ribs. The curve of the snake forms a large open circle through which we see the details of the city in the background. The figure's left arm extends backward in space, leading our eyes to the small horse who seems to prance towards the gates of the city. El Greco depicts the city of Troy as co contemporary Toledo, as he did for Amiens in the St. Martin painting. Here it spreads across the length of the painting and is filled with accurate details of the city. Above it is a stormy sky, which once again expresses the drama of the events taking place in the foreground. Laocoon is a fascinating complex painting, which is open to a wide range of interpretations. One thing scholars agree upon is that El Greco was responding to the famous ancient sculpture of Laocoon and his sons that is part of the Vatican collections. This huge sculpture over two meters in height was unearthed in Rome in 1506 in a private garden on the Esquiline Hill. Its importance was immediately recognized and after sending court artists Giuliano da Sangallo and Michelangelo to see it, Pope Julius II acquired it for the Vatican sculpture collection. The date of the sculpture is uncertain, but it is clearly in the Hellenistic style of the second and first centuries BC. Laocoon and his sons had an enormous influence in the history of art and was a work El Greco certainly would have become familiar with during his time in Rome. Hellenistic sculpture is known for its drama, movement, and emotion, in contrast to the calm and balance of the classical period, much as Baroque art is a response to the High Renaissance. Here in the Laocoon group, these features are present to the highest degree, appropriate to the subject depicted. The bodies bend and twist in agony, their limbs entangled with the serpents. Every inch of Laocoon's body expresses his suffering with incredibly realistic details such as the vein visible in his upper arm. Their faces clearly express emotion and Laocoon's has long been regarded as a paradigm for the expression of pain. El Greco clearly draws from the Hellenistic sculpture in multiple ways, packing the figures in and painting them in white rather than flesh-colored tones. The upward gaze and gesture, let's see if we have the, wait. The upward gaze and gesture of El Greco's left-hand figure are modeled on the same figure in the sculpture who also looks up to heaven and whose right arm once reached upward in an early restoration that El Greco would have known. So this is what it looked like when El Greco saw it and, and until the 1950s when they re-restored it to what it probably more likely looked like. But how different El Greco's conception is. In the classical sculpture, the bodies retain their idealized naturalism and though Laocoon is struggling in agony, he has a heroic quality as if he could still prevail. El Greco's Laocoon figure is cl clearly overcome and at the point of death. One of his sons is already dead. The horrific scene takes place before the city of Toledo, causing the viewer to wonder who the contemporary Laocoon might be and what modern Trojan horse might make the city vulnerable to destruction. But it is in the left-hand figure that El Greco most clearly departs from the classical idiom. The spiritualized figure is far from its very naturalistic model in the antique sculpture. It has an expressive, even abstract quality that El Greco increasingly uses to convey inner realities, whether human suffering, as in this case, or human ecstasy. These qualities are taken to an extreme in the vision of St. John from the same time period as Laocoon. Here there is hardly a sense of real space and the figures are even more dematerialized and abstract. The subject is from the book of Revelation and seems to depict the resurrection of the dead, though the exact moment is unclear. 
It was one of three paintings executed for the Church of St. John the Baptist, part of the Tavera Hospital, just outside the walls of Toledo. The painting was cut down in 1880 during a restoration by the Prado Museum and has, and has sustained other damage over the years. Nevertheless, it remains a masterpiece of El Greco's late style, and among all his paintings, most influenced artists of the modern period. St. John the Evangelist fills the left side of the painting, kneeling on his red cloak and raising his arms in wonder at the vision before him. The bodies of the resurrected occupy the middle ground of the painting. Their undulating outlines are painted in black, flattening them and accentuating the spaces between them. They are placed against yellow and green drapery that presses forward in space, seeming to envelop them. The whole scene vibrates with the rippling lines of the bodies and the jagged edges of the drapery, capturing the visionary mystical character of the Book of Revelation. Scholars have pointed out that El Greco created wax models, which he used as studio casts for the figures in his paintings, especially in his later years. In the vision of St. John, the figure on the far right who receives his white robe from a flying cherub is nearly identical to the left-hand figure in Laocoon. El Greco used the same studio cast for both figures. The third figure from the right Let's go back to the full. So the third, just a second. The third figure from the right stands out for his darker skin tone and more detailed anatomy. His pose is also one that El Greco has used before and as we shall see below that Rodin used for one of his sculptures. The figure kneeling next to him is his mirror image, again suggesting a studio cast. Some of the most expressive poses in El Greco's paintings come from these models, and he seems to have used them, rather than life models, to create less naturalistic, more spiritualized figures. The roots of this practice can be found in El Greco's early training as an icon painter and the theology underlying that tradition. The iconographer and scholar Leonid Uspensky, in his book, The Meaning of Icons, links the visual tradition of icons to the theology of the incarnation, the conjoining of the divine and the human. The incarnation, God becoming flesh, also implies the divinization of man by grace. Human nature, and this is a, a quote from Uspensky, human nature remains what it is, the nature of a creature but the grace of the Holy Spirit penetrates into his nature, combines with it, fills it, and transfigures it. It is this transfigured person that the icon painter wants to represent. As Uspensky explains, and again, this is a quote from Uspensky, the icon is a likeness not of an animate, but of a deified prototype. That is, is an image not of corruptible flesh, but of flesh transfigured radiant with divine light. A temporal portrait of a saint cannot be an icon, precisely because it reflects not his transfigured, but his ordinary carnal state. It is indeed this peculiarity of the icon that sets it apart from all forms of pictorial art. So the icon is considered a likeness and includes characteristics and distinctive traits of the person depicted. This is just a detail from the prior Milwaukee icon. And this is a good example. I, I love this. First of all, it's by Andre Rubloff, who's one of the greatest icon painters in, in the history of art. But it's also the Apostle Paul, who has, as many of you know, distinctive traits. Um, and so there are distinctive personal traits that are portrait-like. But it is a likeness of the transfigured person and only maintains its character as an icon by its link to the traditional depiction of the person. In Uspensky's words, reverently preserving the memory of saints and their characteristics, 
the Orthodox Church has never accepted the painting of their icons from the imagination of the artist or from a living model, for this would involve a complete and conscious rupture with the prototype, and the prototype with whose name the icon is inscribed would be arbitrarily replaced by another person. In order to, to avoid invention and a rupture between the image and the prototype, iconographers paint from ancient icons and make use of aids, um, just as El Greco did. While El Greco's paintings are far removed from the world of icons, he seems to have used aids and repetition of figures in a similar way to emphasize interior rather than exterior realities. It is easy to see in his figures the transfigured beings Uspensky describes, maintaining their physical aspect, but lit from within by divine grace. While the visual tradition and theology of Byzantine art provided a rich source for El Greco and have inspired many other artists through the present day, Western medieval art provides its own vast field of examples of figural distortion used to convey emotion or the presence of the spirit. We need only think of the many images of Christ's twisted body on the cross, the swooning Mary, or the descending angel Gabriel in scenes of the Annunciation. But I would like to focus on Romanesque portrayals of the prophets as particularly evocative figures which add to our understanding of this subject. One of the most well-known figures in Romanesque art is the prophet Isaiah at the Abbey Church of Souillac in the Perigord region of France. This figure was originally among the sculptures of the main western portal of the church. I won't get there yet. But is now awkwardly placed on the inner western wall, squeezed next to the famous Trumeau sculpture of crisscrossed beasts, also originally part of the portal. So you can see Isaiah, and then there's this. I'll, I'll explain more about that later. The Abbey Church of Sainte Marie was built between 1075 and 1150, and its sculptures are dated to around 1130. As with much of Romanesque sculpture, the artist is unknown, but he was a master of relief carving. Isaiah's slender, elongated body is gracefully twisting, with his left leg crossed over his right and his head tilted in the opposite direction. With his right hand, he holds the scroll that identifies him as one of the Old Testament prophets, and with the now broken finger of his left hand, he points to the imaginary words on the scroll. His name, Isaias, is inscribed to the left of his halo. Every detail of the sculpture suggests movement. The double parallel lines of his clothing form a repeated ryth rhythmic pattern. The hem of his cloak flows over his left arm, swinging out behind him as if caught by the wind. The hem of his robe swings out in the opposite direction behind his right foot. The artist has fashioned his hair with long separated locks flowing downward and outward from the top of his head, their outlines echoing those of I Isaiah's body. Isaiah's cross-legged pose is a familiar one in Romanesque sculpture. It, su it suggests walking, but is also meant to convey inner movement. A prophet is a visionary, one who is set apart to carry a message to the society in which he lives. His words and actions are inspired and often misunderstood so that he appears strange to those around him. This is well expressed in the sculpture. Through Isaiah's mobile body and blowing garments, the sculptor conveys the movement of the spirit within and with his emphatic pointing gesture, the importance of the message. At the Abbey Church of St. Peter in Wasak, there is a similar prophet figure, most likely the prophet Jeremiah. This exquisite figure is carved on the right side of the trumeau, or central post, of the main portal to the church. Above is one of the great Romanesque scenes of Christ in majesty, inspired by the Theophanies in the book of Revelation. Here, the vision of Christ surrounded by the four living creatures and the 24 elders from chapter four. And here's a detail. So 
Supporting this vision are the figures of Saints Peter on the left jam. So this is Peter. St. Paul and the prophet Jeremiah on the sides of the trumo. So you can't see it in the slide, but St. Paul is here facing Peter and then Jeremiah facing Isaiah. And Isaiah on the right jam. The front of the trumo depicts crisscross beasts like those at Suyak. The figure of Jeremiah is powerfully expressive. In order to fit him into the narrow side of the trumeau, his form is even more attenuated than Isaiah at Suyak. He has the same twisted pose, expressing grace and movement. Here, the X form of his crossed legs is more accentuated because viewed from the front. The X calls to mind that the prophet is a sign of contradiction to the world. He holds his message with both hands, and his eyes seem to gaze inwards. This is an incredible detail. It's interesting to compare Jeremiah with the figure of Paul on the other side of the trumeau. So here's Paul. Paul is squeezed into a similar space, and his body is equally elongated, but his pose is completely different. Though one knee is slightly bent, he stands solidly facing front, with little movement apart from the turn of his head. Holding the book representing his writings in one hand, he raises the other and gazes intently forward. With these two poses, the sculptor suggests the different characters and roles of the prophet and the apostle. The Romanesque pro prophets are just one example of the powerful language of medieval sacred art, which was able to convey divine presence through the human body. This language remained as a vast provocation in the history of art, whether it was rejected, as in much of high Renaissance art, or admired and incorporated, as in the art of El Greco. During the early modern period, at the beginning of the 20th century, Artists once again turn to this language to express new forms of spirituality. One of these artists was Pablo Picasso, who for a period in his early years turned to El Greco and earlier sacred art as inspiration for an expressive style of his own. Last May, I had the good fortune to see the wonderful Picasso show at the Phillips Collection here in Washington, Picasso, Painting the Blue Period. The show was groundbreaking in many ways, not just for focusing on this one period of Picasso's work, but for exploring more deeply Picasso's connections to other artists and to earlier religious art. Despite his secular subject matter, Picasso used the language of sacred art to create expressive human figures, whose poses and gestures speak in a modern context of the inner life. The Phillips Show focused on the years 1901 to 1904, when Picasso lived in Barcelona but spent long periods in Paris with studios in both cities. At first, his art reflected the world of Montmartre with its nightlife, dance halls, and brothels. But in autumn of 1901, he underwent a marked change in both style and subject matter, entering what is known as his blue period. His palette shifted from bright colors to predominantly blue tones. And his subject matter became more serious with images of the poor and the outcasts of society. The excellent exhibition catalog accompanying the Phillips show explores the causes for this major shift in Picasso's art, among which are lingering sadness over the death of his close friend, Carlos Casagemas, in February 1901, his visits to the Saint Lazar Women's Prison Hospital, which began in the early autumn of that year, and the artistic influence of El Greco, which was ongoing. El Greco's influence on Picasso is well known. Picasso first saw the art of El Greco in 1897 at the age of 15, when he went with his art class to Toledo. 
Soon after that, he visited the Prado Museum in Madrid and wrote to a friend of some magnificent heads by El Greco. He made another trip to Toledo in early spring of 1901, after his artistic career was established, to further study El Greco's paintings. It's important to note that Picasso was not alone in his zeal for El Greco. It was in these very years that the earlier Spanish artist was rediscovered and became a focus for the modernists in Catalonia. These artists made regular pilgrimages to the nearby town of Sigis to see in the collection of artist Sebastián Roussignol two El Greco paintings, the Penitent Saint Peter, which is now in the Phillips collection here in DC, just keeps happening, and Mary Magdalene with the cross. So these were in a collection very close to Barcelona that, that all of the artists knew of. Zeal for El Greco spread well beyond Catalonia to Paris and from there across the ocean to the United States. It was in 1906 that the American painter Mary Cassatt convinced the trustees of the Art Institute of Chicago to purchase El Greco's Assumption of the Virgin, which instantly brought him into the wider public eye of this country. But the most immediate catalyst for Picasso's blue period seems to have been his visits to the Saint Lazare Women's Hospital in Paris, as was detailed in the exhibition catalog. In the early autumn of 1901, a doctor acquaintance suggested that Picasso accompany him on his visits to the hospital, which was attached to the prison. Here, Picasso found a rich source of new subjects. He was allowed to observe the women, many of whom had their young children with them in the prison. Upon returning to his studio after his visits, he created the drawings and paintings that began his new style. One group of paintings was inspired by the women with their infants, as in the beautiful mother and child from the Harvard Art Museums. The mother is seated on the ground with knees pulled up, a pose that Picasso will repeat in several other paintings. Bending her head and resting it on the head of her child, she closes her eyes, turning inward and encircling the child in a protective embrace. The woman's beautifully delineated features, white headscarf and blue robes evoke images of the Madonna and child, as does the child's mature, pensive expression. Picasso also made many paintings of women alone, as in Woman Ironing, painted in December 1901, only a few months after he began visiting Saint Lazare. According to the museum label, the woman's bonnet and apron identify her as an inmate of the prison, and she is doing the laundry work that was required there. The figure of the woman fills the canvas, bringing her close to us. There is a simplicity to Picasso's style here, with swift and vis visible brush strokes and a limited palette of blues, white, and flesh tones. What is most striking, and in fact defines the painting, is the woman's pose. She bends over her ironing, the arc of her back accentuated by a dark outline, with her head at a 45 degree angle to her body. This is a pose Picasso will continue to use, and it clearly had special meaning for him. It expresses sadness, the underlying theme of the blue period, but also a kind of self-containment and inwardness. Though she is ironing, her eyes are closed, like the woman in Mother and Child, and this contributes to the feeling of interiority and even contemplation evoked by the painting. Picasso repeats the bent head pose with small variations in numerous paintings from this period. Among them is Dozing Absinthe Drinker, a subject from the cafe near Saint Lazare, frequented by the outpatients from the hospital. Let's see if I have a close up. Here are the same bent head and closed eyes with the arc of the woman's back echoed in the arch of the wall and the curved edge of the table. In Two Sisters, subtitled The Meeting, Picasso depicts, and this is a quote from a letter, a prostitute from Saint Lazare and a mother, as he described them in a letter to a friend, 
in a composition clearly derived from images of the visitation. In a beautiful study drawing for the painting, Picasso worked out the poses of the two women, focusing primarily on the left-hand figure with her bent head and closed eyes. This pose is amplified in meaning in one of the centerpiece paintings from the Phillips show, The Soup. It's just a close-up of the drawing. From early 1903. In this scene, a woman bends her head over a steaming bowl of soup, which she hands to a young girl. Though this canvas is only 15 by 18 inches, the figures have a monumentality, with the woman's body extending the full height of the painting. Picasso modeled the scene on contemporary murals depicting the virtue of charity, recasting the bowed down pose as one of offering. The woman's closed eyes create the same sense of interiority expressed in the other paintings, but here, accompanied by the giving gesture, it takes on the spirit of prayer. While Picasso did not continue to paint the women of Saint Lazare after early 1903, he maintained his blue period style and themes. A masterpiece of this phase is the old guitarist at the Art Institute of Chicago begun in December 1903 and completed early the next year. This is a more complex painting in which Picasso emphasizes the geometry of the forms, merging the beggar with the wall behind him. Once again, the figure fills the canvas, bringing him practically into our space. His body is emaciated, with thin fingers plucking and pressing on the strings of the guitar. His face is rendered in profile, sharply delineated, with blind eyes and an open mouth. The head is bent at the familiar 45 degree angle, but here it sinks below his shoulder, which juts upward in a distorted way. Picasso emphasizes the horizontality of the head, which parallels the stripe of the background wall and intersects the vertical of his flattened torso. At the center of the composition is the guitar, whose brown color contrasts with the cool blue tones of the rest of the painting, as if to suggest that music provides the only warmth for this destitute man. Many have commented on this painting's debt to El Greco, in its familiar blue tones and attenuated figure, but especially in the head of the musician. The detailed shadows and bright white highlights recall El Greco's heads of the penitent St. Peter in his many renderings of that subject, at least one of which Picasso would have known well, the one that, that we saw. Later in 1904, Picasso combined the pose of the old guitarist with an earlier theme from his Saint Lazare days in a new version of Woman, un of Woman Ironing. Here, the woman stands behind the ironing table and bends slightly forward over her work. Her gaunt form and the position of her head and upper body echo the figure of the old guitarist. And in another echo from that painting, Picasso has rendered her eyes as a deep shadow, suggesting blindness. With its pale colors and delicate outlines, this painting is very different in tone from the earlier woman ironing. It provides a bridge between Picasso's blue period and the style of his circus paintings of the following years. During these early years, Picasso explored the expressive potential of the human figure, with specific poses representing human feelings and states of being. The bent over pose, which he uses so frequently, evokes sadness, humility, and supplication. This pose and the closed eyes also suggest interiority, drawing the viewer in and creating a human connection with us. I'd like to turn now to the sculptor Auguste Rodin, whose work was almost exclusively dedicated to the human figure. When Dr. McCarthy suggested a lecture on the human figure in art, Rodin was the artist who first came to mind. My own interest in him dates to my first trip to Paris as a young woman 
when I was bowled over by the sculptures in the Rodin Museum. The Art Institute of Chicago has several superb Rodin works, including an original plaster cast he submitted to the World's Columbian Exposition in 1893. So this looks like bronze, but that's just, a, that's just paint covering plaster. In 2017, the museum, um, and this is the Art Institute of Chicago, mounted a small Rodin exhibit to commemorate the 100th anniversary of his death, which inspired me to create a tour entitled The Inner and Outer Self, looking at how artists express the immaterial through the material. Rodin indicated his aims when he said, I have always endeavored to express inner feelings by the mobility of the muscles. Rodin was born in 1840, and though he failed to get into the School of Fine Arts, his early training as a sculptor was in the academic tradition, as was typical in the mid-19th century. Artistic training was based on drawing from life models and the study of classical and Renaissance figures, and Rodin's mastery of the human figure was unsurpassed. But like Monet, his, exact, his friend and exact contemporary, Rodin wanted to free himself from the academic tradition, introducing elements of abstraction and emphasizing subjective experience of reality rather than scientific objectivity. Rodin's art is poetic, and it's no wonder that one of his greatest champions was the poet Rainer Maria Rilke, who met Rodin in 1902, worked as his secretary from 1905 to 1906, and wrote two laudatory essays about him. Looked at in terms of their whole career, Rodin and Picasso couldn't be more different. Rodin remaining grounded in observation of nature and Picasso leading the avant-garde in rejecting that. But as the Phillips exhibition convincingly showed, Rodin had a great influence on Picasso during his early years. In late 1900, Picasso visited Rodin's private pavilion during the Universal Exposition in Paris and would have seen the thinker, Eve, and inner voice among the 150 sculptures Rodin exhibited. Picasso's interest in Rodin is evidenced by his inclusion of Rodin's head with his name written above it on a sheet of sketches from around that same time. And there's Rodin and then his name, I don't know if you can see it, is, is above it. Picasso and his fellow modernists included an article on Rodin with a photo of the thinker in their magazine early the following year. I'd like to look at three Rodin sculptures, Adam, the Prodigal Son, and Inner Voice. The bronze sculpture Adam is truly monumental, standing at six and a half feet high, though bent over, so well over life size. Whoops, not ready for that. Modeled in 1881, the Art Institute's version of Adam was cast around 1924 and purchased by the museum the same year. Adam was originally conceived as part of a larger project for a set of monumental bronze doors to serve as the entrance to a new decorative arts museum in Paris. Rodin received the commission in 1880, and though the museum never came to fruition, Rodin's work on the doors continued through the 1880s, and the figures he originally created for the doors became some of his most famous works. The theme for the doors was to be Dante's Inferno, and the overall work was titled The Gates of Hell. At the very top of the double doors was to be the seated figure of Dante, a sculpture which became the thinker. So I don't know if you knew that, but the thinker was originally Dante. <laughs> To the left and right of the doors were to be the figures of Adam and Eve, which Rodin did not include in his final model of the doors, but which became important independent sculptures as well. The gates were first cast in bronze in 1938, well after Rodin's death. Rodin's Adam is a blend of naturalism and expressive distortion. The anatomical details are both precise and exaggerated. It is often noted that the figure was inspired by the work of Michelangelo. Its overall conception is reminiscent of Michelangelo's figures of the rebellious slave and the dying slave, which he created for the tomb of Pope Julius II. 
Well, these are just some different views of the atom. Here are Michelangelo's slaves. Adam's twisted left arm echoes the arm of Christ in Michelangelo's 1499 Pieta. And the pointing finger recalls the finger of God creating Adam in the Sistine ceiling. Rodin absorbs and transforms Michelangelo's art in the contorted figure of the fallen Adam. His body twists and overlaps itself in anguish as he realizes what he has done. His entire body has a downward movement with compressed torso, bent head, and finger pointing to the earth from which he came. Even the toes of his left foot clench the ground beneath him. Every muscle and tendon is visible, even exaggerated, as if to express the intensity of Adam's feelings. Particularly striking is the position of the head, perpendicular to the body with the shoulder and neck overstretched. Rodin used the same pose for his sculpture, The Shade, modeled in the same year, though there the head and neck are even more distorted. It is the pose Picasso took up and used to similar effect in The Old Guitarist. Perhaps he had taken note of it in Rodin's pavilion during the Universal Exposition of 1900. Another sculpture with origins in the Gates of Hell Commission is Rodin's Prodigal Son. This figure began as one of the sons in the group of Ugolino and his sons from Dante's Inferno on the lower left door. It's hard to read this, but <laughs> the jumble of figures, but here is this figure. Later, Rodin reworked the figure, combining its head and torso with a different lower body. He titled the new figure, The Prodigal Son. What is most striking to me about this sculpture is its resemblance to El Greco's figures, especially in his late works. Is there a connection between Rodin and El Greco? Apparently, yes. Susan Behrens Frank, one of the curators of the Phillips Picasso exhibit, not only shows Rodin's profound influence on Picasso, she details Rodin's interest in El Greco. In her chronology, she includes the fact that in June 1905, Rodin traveled to Spain with fellow artist Ignacio Zuluaga where they saw El Greco's Vision of St. John, the painting we just looked at, in a private collection in Cordoba. Zuloaga purchased the painting and hung it in his Paris studio, where Picasso frequently saw it, and Rodin could see it again as well. It's tempting to think that the prodigal son was inspired by the darker kneeling figure in the Vision of St. John. The dates suggest that Rodin's first version of the prodigal son predates his 1905 trip. But whether or not Rodin did take from this specific figure, his debt to El Greco is clear. The figure of the prodigal son is quite different from Adam. Like El Greco's figures, the body is thinned and stretched with similar rippling contours. There is the same dematerialization of the body a turning away from the Renaissance naturalism that inspired the earlier sculpture. The prodigal son kneels on the ground and reaches up and back with both arms, bending his head back to look upwards. It is difficult to pinpoint what feelings Rodin meant to express in this sculpture. It could depict the moment when the prodigal son repents and says, I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Or it could be a more general evocation of prayer, as indicated by one posthumous retitling of the work, which called it simply prayer. It is interesting to think of the sculpture in light of El Greco's vision of St. John, in which the kneeling figure is rising from the dead. Rodin is expressing resurrection as well in the spiritual awakening of the prodigal son.
The last work I'd like to look at is Rodin's sculpture, Inner Voice, subtitled The Muse, from 1896 to 97. The sculpture was originally intended as one of two muses flanking Victor Hugo for a monument to the writer commissioned in 1886. Rodin's proposal was rejected, but he continued to work on this figure, altering it and retitling it in her voice. In this female figure, Rodin combines a serpentine pose with the look of an antique sculptural fragment to express the idea of creative inspiration. Here is the familiar bent head with overstretched neck and raised shoulder. But the shoulder is only partial, as Rodin has intentionally cut off the arms of the figure. The left knee is also cut off and does not jut out beyond the right leg as it should. You can see it better in this, in this image. The pose is an exaggerated contrapposto, which means the bent knee pose of classical sculpture. For Rodin, this pose evoked antiquity and its rebirth in the Renaissance. This can be seen in a pair of clay models he made in 1911. First, let's look at the different views, this inner muse. And th these have the longest title known to man, but uh, <laughs> these are entitled Pair of Standing Nude Male Figures Demonstrating the Principles of Contrapposto According to Michelangelo and Phidias. <laughs> that says it all. These are now at the Met Museum in New York. Uh, I, I had never even heard of these before preparing for this talk. They're absolutely amazing. Here, the model representing the ancient Greek sculptor Phidias, so that's um, you know, on the right, has a relaxed contrapposto pose typical of the idealized figures of that period, so it's more classical. The model representing Michelangelo has a more contorted contrapposto, such as Rodin himself used for Adam and inner voice. With inner voice, Rodin reinterprets the figure of the muse from Greek mythology, adapting an antique pose and intentionally fragmenting the sculpture. But the pose and fragmentary nature of inner voice do more than evoke antiquity. They convey the inner source of creative inspiration. Speaking of inner voice, Rilke wrote, again and again, Rodin returns in his figures to this inward bending to this concentrated listening to one's own depths. Never has a human body been so concentrated about its inner self, so bowed by its own soul. And that's from Rilke's um, work, Rodin, just titled Rodin, published in 1903. In a later publication of 1907, Rilke spoke of the fragmentary nature of this sculpture using the phrase, armless as inwardness. For Rilke, the absence of arms accentuates the inner life of the figure, just as the dematerialization of the body accentuated the spiritual in Byzantine and medieval art. Inner voice is Rodin's depiction of the spirit as a source of creativity and human expression. I think this is the last. Yeah, that's the last one. This evening, we have looked at works of art in which the human figure is depicted expressionistically rather than realistically. We have seen artists using anatomical distortion, elongation and attenuation of the body, twisting and bent over poses, and dramatic gestures to convey inner, non-visible aspects of the person. We began with El Greco, who used these means to express the suffering of Laocoon's son, the resurrected bodies of St. John's vision, and even Christ himself, who appears in the guise of the lowly beggar. Picasso's blue period figures also express suffering, specifically the loneliness and hunger of the outcasts of society. But their bowed down bodies and closed eyes also suggest supplication and an interiority that is akin to prayer. Rodin maintained a strong link to the naturalism of classical sculpture, but used anatomical distortion, exaggerated poses, and fragmentation 
to convey emotion, thought, and the spirit within. These three artists are historically connected in interesting ways and speak to each other across the centuries through their expressive figures. Their way of depicting the figure has roots, either directly or indirectly, in Byzantine and Western medieval art. Two branches of the art historical tree, which rejected the naturalism of the classical world for more spiritualized depictions of the human figure. Neither Byzantine nor Western medieval art rejected the body as such, and both maintained an awareness of human anatomy. But there was a desire to show the body transfigured, holy, or prophetic. Emotion and inner life were expressed through pose and gesture rather than through facial expression. In addition, the liturgical and devotional function of much of Byzantine and medieval art meant that art was intended to interact with the beholder, to call forth a response. Later artists like El Greco, and especially the moderns, looked to medieval art for this interactive quality, using similar expressive means to create empathy, arouse emotions, or prompt contemplation. But why is it that these expressive figures are able to convey so well the inner things that are not visible? It seems to be rooted in the very nature of the human being, who is a conjunction of the material and the immaterial. It is impossible to depict, to depict the non-visible. It can only be accomplished through the visible. The artist must express through the body that which is not corporeal. He must, through matter, depict that which is not material. Artists de-emphasize, distort, or alter the corp corporeal body in order to show that there is more. There is something within and beyond. The artistic endeavor is, in a sense, an incarnational act. Nowhere is this expressed better than in Pope John Paul II's Letter to Artists of April 4, 1999. There he says, Art must make perceptible, and as far as possible attractive, the world of the spirit, of the invisible, of God. It must therefore translate into meaningful terms that which is in itself ineffable. John Paul II makes clear that he is not talking only about religious art, but about every artistic endeavor. And again, this is a quote from John Paul II. Artists are constantly in search of the hidden meaning of things, and their torment is to succeed in expressing the world of the ineffable. This is why the artist is an image of God the creator, shaping material, giving it form and meaning, and letting it go into the world. In a direct appeal to artists, John Paul II states, humanity in every age, and even today, looks to works of art to shed light upon its path and its destiny. I hope that I have shed some light on just one way in which artists have given form and meaning to the ineffable. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for your, for your talk. Uh, I'm not an expert at all, so I learned, I guess, as much as you did uh, tonight, which is really great, even before, because I had uh, a little preview of the talk. So thank you. Thanks a lot, Sarah. And I, I would like to, to um, comment on your talk a little bit to go back to the, the premise, which I find really important. Um, I mean, you, you say at the beginning the, the, the human figure is at the center of art history, and we can wonder then why did it disappear in the past 100 years or so, like almost completely, if you see any sort of chronological museum. When you start 20th century, it progressively disappears until um, being completely, you know, you can have entire galleries without any human figure. And what we you explained very well tonight is that Representing the human figure is a very difficult task. It's not like anybody can paint or sculpt a head. Anybody can do that. But representing the human figure is not, it's not just a head. It's the human face. It's the, it's the human person. I love what you said about the, the parallel you made with iconography. Because when in the 
8th century, I believe it was the iconoclast crisis, uh, discussed whether or not icons of Christ should be painted. The argument against icons was that if you paint an icon, you can only paint the, the human nature of Jesus, and therefore icons has, are necessarily monophysite. And the argument in favor, which prevailed, uh, the church defended icons, saying when you paint Christ, you do not paint his human nature, you paint the person. And it's not just a nominal exit of a problem. Like It's very different to paint the person, as you showed, there's the, the codes, the whole language of symbols, the, 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 the pose of Christ, the, the gesture of the hand, the colors. I mean, all those symbols that they had to use in order to paint the person. That is to paint Jesus as the Son of God. How do you paint a relationship when you cannot paint the Father? How do you paint that Jesus is the Son and you cannot paint the Father. It sounds like an impossible problem to solve, but that's, the, that's what they had to do. And so they had to, to paint the person. And the artists that you showed, I mean, a lot of those paintings are secular painting, but even secular painters, they face, they face also a theological problem. Because how do you paint the human person who's an image of God? How do you paint freedom? How do you paint sin? How do you paint ecstasy? A painting a human body can be done by anyone who has some skill in anatomy. But skill can, is not enough and can even become a distraction when you come to the threshold of that mystery of the human person. And the reason why in the past 100 years we've been artists almost incapable of painting the human person is because we've, uh, to a large extent, lost the meaning of what it means to be, to be human, as, as Margie explained in her in her introduction. So I would like to go a, a little bit uh, deeper and, and hopefully dig a little deeper into your some of the, the doors you've opened for us tonight. You showed the, the commonalities between El Greco, Rodin, and Picasso in as much as they distort almost violently sometimes the human body in order to suggest that they're painting more than a human body, that there's a spirit inside. Is, um, and you show what they have in common and how they influence each other. But I, I would like to, um, to show the, the distinction, because I think they're also, if they paint the human person, they have clearly a conception of the human person, which is very, very different, the three of them. And, uh, and how, it, take for example El Greco, I love that when you showed us of St. John, the ecstasy of St. John. I mean, El Greco kind of stretches the human body as if it were a rubber. And I, I love the fact that it, um, you mentioned he paint after wax models because they really look like candles. You know, the undulating form, the, 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 the whiteness of their flesh, everything evokes like it says if every human being for El Greco is an altar candle and it all points up this, this sense of ecstasy, you know, also referring to icons, that idea of a focal point which is outside the painting, they seem to be all stretched towards something which is above and beyond the painting. Whereas in Rodin, I was seen the Adam, for instance, or even the, the last, the, the inner voice, I think it was called. The movement of Rodin is very different. The movement, as you pointed, is downward. Uh, if El Greco stretches the body to suggest that yearning for something greater than us. I think Rodin does the opposite. He seems to constantly compress the body uh, to the point of almost breaking it, and sometimes actually breaking it, breaking the arms, breaking the hand. Uh, but it, it, he applies tremendous uh, pressure on the body and if you, even if you think of the thinker, we all love the thinker because it's such a famous sculpture, but I don't know what kind of thinking that is. If you, if you look at the pose of the thinker, it looks like a, a, you know, a closed fist. It's not much, and, and he's, um, I don't know, it's, it's, like it's, it's, very, it's a very strange pose. Try to think like this, and I don't think you'll go very far. <laughs> I don't know. Like it, if it's very sort of, the movement is very inward, like absorbed in the self whereas El Greco is, 
that extension towards another self with an upcase S, you know. So I would like to um, give you a chance to respond to that. What do you think about the distinctions about those, you know, those two conceptions of um, the human condition, I guess? Is this on? Yes. <laughs> Um, I think that's a really good observation. I, I included, you know, three artists who are very different and who are from different periods. And um, El Greco was in a period where he was doing sacred art and, and he had um, those subjects. Rodin is a 19th century artist and he's, you know, I thought a lot about, so what are the inner things that each of these artists is expressing? Um, the inner thing could be the Holy Spirit, as in you know the prophets, um, but the inner could also be emotion, or I think in the case of Rodin, he's in the, the era of psychology. So, um, you know, th so the parallels are that they're they're they are using similar artistic methods to depict something that is spiritual, but what they mean by spiritual is is vastly different. I think that's what you're getting at. So, um, because, because Rodin saw himself as depicting the spirit, for sure, but it's not necessarily, you know, the Holy Spirit with a capital S, as is obvious in, the, in religious art. Um, Picasso, well, you might want to say, when we talked earlier, something about Picasso, but Picasso, oddly, in a way, um, and perhaps this is because he had um, such strong Catholic influences in his home. He grew up in a very religious home, and in the Phillips exhibition catalog, there is the most beautiful um, Mater Dolorosa torso sculpture that was in Picasso's home that he grew up with. Um, not to mention that he was surrounded by sacred art in Catalonia and in his circles. So in some sense, there's more religious influence in his work than there is in Rodin's, which does seem more secular, more psychological, maybe more, you could say, Freudian. Um, and, and, you know, I, I only showed certain works, but a lot of Rodin's works are very sexual. Um, it's, it's just a completely different, I agree with your, your distinction that you're making. I mean, one, one paradox of Rodin is that he, his work is very sexual, very explicit, and he himself was known for his love of women, but also I think it's also his weakness is that I don't, I don't think he can really uh, look at a woman w without possessing her. Like, it, it might sound shocking, but um, I think in Rodin there's no eros, or very little. There's a, in, in El Greco I see a lot of eros, a great yearning for something greater, like those bodies outstretched. But in Rodin, so absorbed in the self um, that even even when women think about the kiss for instance which is famous we didn't see it tonight but uh, more than a kiss it seems that a man is a, is about to devour the woman like he's going to absorb there's a, there's a famous uh, uh, encounter um, read that somewhere Isadora Duncan the choreographer she met with Rodin and he said he was he had this kind of magnetic force but she had to, she had to to run away from him. He said, she said, you, f you feel like his, the, his gravitational pull is so strong that you're going to lose yourself in him. And he had this, this thing where he, he said he, he embraced you and, and uh, there, there's no more room for the, for the other. And I think it's the weakness of, of Rodin. And, and that's not a uh, coincidence if Rodin was commissioned the door of hell, because there's something quite hellish when you think about a lot of his work about the, the loneliness and how this kind of absorption in the self, where the self becomes the center, where the center of gravity is inside. And, you know, this door of hell is so crowded, but nobody touches anybody, really. Like, everybody is absorbed with their suffering or with their thinking or with their... It's all about me, myself, and I. So he... It, it did touch something spiritual, I mean, to touch that reality, the reality of sin. It's not redeemed by much hope or faith, but you can at least give him credit for that. Is in the 19th century, which was a very difficult when you look at the, the 19th century galleries in Orsay. It's quite depressing, really. 
all, all that you see in the 19th century has been a very hard century, and, and Rodin kind of expresses that sense of gravity, and you understand why Van Gogh arrived at the end of the 19th century with such a breath of fresh air, and much more on the side of El Greco, like this kind of explosion of life and very mystical, um, complete ecstasy of the whole creation. But to go back to Rodin, yeah, he, he sent something of that hell, which is part of life. And whereas El Greco was commissioned to paint the heavenly Jerusalem because he, that's what he tended to, that's what his whole being tended to. He had that sense of divine beauty. Um, so certainly two very, two very different visions also of the, the human being. And, and Picasso, you, you're right, I think it's a very interesting choice of artists because Picasso stands kind of in, in the middle between the two. His, his body is very similar to the ones in Rodin, the kind of broken, as you mentioned, like the head at the right angle, the, the body folded in itself, but not completely closed. I, I really loved some of the, the, the blue period paintings that you showed, the fact that the body always has that concave form, sometimes emphasized by the presence of a, so the, the woman ironing, I don't know if you saw there's a bowl, there's an empty bowl in front of her, which you find in another painting of the same period, the, um, the blind man's meal, also with that empty bowl turned heavenward, or there's a woman too with the, the glass in front of her. And it reminded me of that sculpture of uh, Saint, Ignatius, Saint, Saint Ignatius in Barcelona, in the church where he used to sit to beg, and it's that sculpture where, a modern sculpture, but the, the artist represented the whole body of St. Ignatius as an open hand. Like as if his whole body was begging to be filled. And I think in Picasso of that period, it's really what he shows. Like a Rodin there, you feel like the statue is closed on itself, closed in its shell. But Picasso, it has its humility of a yearning or... or begging for something, it really like a, yeah, the, the poverty of Picasso during that period, and he, he went through a different, uh, quite different path. But during that period, it's extremely moving how he acknowledges his own poverty and his own need to be filled by something greater. And do you, um, so when we think about Picasso, we think a lot about the, the later work, um, be curious to hear you about, do you sense some of that um, distortion of the body become very extreme in later work, in the later work of Picasso, how he more than distorted it, he broke it apart. Uh, what do you think that tells us about our 20th century? Uh, oh, I don't know about that. I, I'm always amazed by how Picasso went from those paintings to Cubism. I mean, you, you, when you go to the Art Institute, you have the old guitarist, and right next to it is you know, the analytic cubist painting of his, of his dealer, Daniel Henry Conviler, which is completely cubist. It still has the figure, and um, they're only six years apart. And in between, you know, he's also doing cubist works. So, and, and for me, cubism is very intellectual. It, it's, um, it lacks the feeling uh, that, that's in these early paintings. And I, I frankly don't really understand it. I think you can look at it just art historically. Picasso was someone who was always influenced by other artists. So in the Phillips show, they you know, really talked about the early influence, say, of Toulouse-Lautrec, Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec, in that, that first painting I showed um, when he was doing um, all his work in Montmartre. Um, and then, and I did hear recently, and I, I was trying to place where I heard it, that Picasso's phases are very influenced by, by what he was looking at or experiencing. So the fact that he went to that hospital of Saint Lazare actually helped bring about his blue period. And he later said that the death of this friend was the, was the sort of initiator of his blue period. So you know, I can only think that, so, you know, Picasso had a huge ego. He knew from early on that he wanted to be, he wanted to be the new El Greco, he wanted to be the new greatest artist in every period, and I think 
he saw what was happening in art and Cubism was his way of forging, forging ahead with that. But in doing so, he left behind something very meaningful, I think. I, I can't really explain it because it's, it has to do with you know, his, his person and, and also art history at that time. Other people, you know, George Brock was inventing Cubism alongside Picasso. So, but this idea of, like we were talking earlier, um, going from distortion to just really breaking down the form, breaking down the forms and um, making them you know, kind of analytical and showing all these different perspectives at the same time, that becomes something almost philosophical, like making philosophical points about reality, about subjectivity. Um, I don't see the blue period figures as philosophical. They seem more contemplative and just exploring, exploring the human person. But there's, there's two um, two things that ma that make me like um, like you. I mean, I'm very very moved by the paintings of this early p blue period. But two things that made me uh, look with compassion, if not admiration, at the later Picasso is first one thing is that he never abandoned the human face when and and. I don't know if it was intentional because it feels like he's trying very much to be abstract to get completely read, uh, rid of, of that earlier um, contemplative sense of contemplation, of prayer, of love. And he, he tries to break free from that, but as if he can't, you know, he's trying. It was the image that comes to my mind is like you, you break something, you say you've, you know, you're married, you're divorced, and you have an object in your room that reminds you like a vase that was a gift from that person which now you hate. So you, you break it, you get rid of it, but then even the fragments left on the floor it still reminds you of that person. Like, and it feels like he breaks apart the human person, but it's still, it's still there. Like he can't get rid of it until the end. He never became an abstract painter. Even though he seemed to be sort of following whatever was happening in the world, he seemed to be like running after it, trying to be better than the others but he always remained a figurative painter. And then the second thing, it's a painting that's in Antibes, in southern France, one of his last paintings, a very large painting of, of um, Odysseus when, and the sirens. And he's on the boat, he's attached, um, so, he, you know, so he asked his uh, teammates, his shipmates to attach him so he could listen to the song of the sirens but not, not run after them and lose himself. And the, the, the center of the painting is occupied by the face of Odysseus just crying in agony and the sirens are dancing and singing all over him and the agony of that face because I think there's something of the agony of Picasso that he decided he always felt that there was something greater in the human being he always remained on the threshold but never wanted to dive in and it was a great suffering for him when he saw that Matisse who was his friend and rival sort of um, move ahead and start to make a, a chapel and sort of enter into mystical territory and he had kind of sworn he would never enter into that and he knew he couldn't follow him because he had decided not to follow him and, and the agony that he decided, he took the decision to limit his art to remain superficial in a sense uh, and that kind of cry that on his on his face, uh, I see it as an auto portrait. Maybe I'm, I'm extrapolating, but uh, but it makes me look at Picasso as like. Overall, you could say Picasso is you know f failed a lot of his work. I think fails, but it's that sense of tragedy at the end that redeems. I think his work. Uh, maybe some kind of confession of his uh, kind of self spiritual mut mutilation or something like that. I almost regret having to pause that conversation. We do want to give, however, space for questions from uh, the audience. Uh, I believe Agata, you're out there. Uh, raise up your hand and she will uh, deliver a microphone. Uh, try to keep uh, questions uh, concise just so we can get as many in as uh, possible. We appreciate that. Yeah, we're, we only have time for uh, a small number, so thank you. Uh, 
Uh, thank you for the excellent talk and the um, following discussion. It's uh, very invigorating. Uh, I'm curious about a point that you noted earlier um, with El Greco, actually, in the uh, St. Martin and the Beggar, how he's in contemporary dress. Um, and obviously, you know, that's fairly common in art history, especially in, in the medieval period as well, to depict figures from the distant past in contemporary dress. And there is that element in art nowadays, um, but it's not necessarily as normative as it was then, at least is my understanding. I'm a classicist, so I, I tend to look at things in a broad historical art, but I'm not an art historian. Um, and that just, that just struck me because I think how we depict people in the past says a lot about our relationship with the past and with our own humanity. And so I'm just curious, like, assuming I'm observing this correctly, when does that change um, as far as how you, de whether you depict someone as contemporary who is from the past and why does that change come about? Um, good question. The first point is I see that, I don't know if this is true, but I associate that particularly with Christian art because of the idea that these, these events are always present. So um, an example would be an altarpiece, you know, the Ayala altarpiece at the Art Institute where you have the, the crucifixion and you have the children of the donor kneeling at the cross. So it's a historical event that took place, you know, in the time of Christ. But, but people are kneeling at the cross as if it's right now. I mean, that is, that is core to Christianity. So um, what El Greco does is, you know, is, is it goes with actually the theme of the painting as well, because charity, he, it's about the virtue of charity. It's, a, it's um, asking people to think about themselves in terms of, you know, giving their own cloak to the beggar. So I think it has to do with the universal themes and, and this idea that, well, we do it in the mass every Sunday. We repeat the events. The events are in the present. And so um, now, but getting to your the historical aspect of your question, um, when did this, I mean, I, I'm not sure how to answer that. I mean, it's certainly in the Baroque period that was still happening. And then you have an artist like Caravaggio where the figures, even more in terms of his style, look like just the people that you'd see in a tavern or something. Um, and you know, he has the the famous um, kneeling kneeling people kneeling at the Madonna of Loreto with, and you can see their dirty feet and, and that kind of thing. Um, I don't really know how to answer when that when that stopped or started. I, honestly, I, I just I think that's just something that that is part of Christian art, um, and it's also interesting. There's also an interesting dichotomy that happens where apostles or people from Jesus' time are shown are not shown in contemporary dress. This is very common, where the apostles will be, or Christ, will be in a long robe and, and sandals, and then the other people in the painting will be in contemporary dress. So that's, that's another um, example of that kind of thing. But I, I, I don't know about a, a shift that I can think of. There's someone that, oh, 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 hi. <laughs> On a, hello. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Um, sorry. My name is Donny McManus. I'm. Um, I. Uh, I was inspired by John Paul II's letter to artists to start a, a career as an artist as a sculptor oh. in '99. Uh, that's. At, were you at the the address? No, no. Oh. I, I when I read the letter in '99, I came to the New York Academy to study. Did a master's in New York Academy, then founded the Irish Academy of Figurative Art and the Sacred Art School of Firenze, in Florence. Uh, I'm now artist in residence here across the road in CUA. I uh, just started this year. And Amazing. My, <laughs> my approach has been essentially a theology of the body in the context of life drawing to reconstruct the grammar of artistic anatomy in the context of the philosophy and theology of John Paul II so as to reconstruct human sexuality in the in, in, and the grammar of visual, visual art, figurative art together, so as to marry truth, goodness, and beauty together. Now, this is something I'm hoping to do maybe with the interdisciplinary program with, with the university, with the theology, philosophy, and art department. Uh, so have you any 
uh, ideas along that line of the future of visual arts? Oh my gosh. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I certainly can't predict. Um, what I can say is that figurative art is well and truly back in terms of, and you know, my friend Jane Malash, who's in contemporary art, could say more about this. I'm that it's not my field. Uh, contemporary art isn't my field, or, or Father Paul, who, who works with contemporary artists. But certainly for, well, I don't know how many years, at least 20, I, I, I can't remember, the figure is, is back as far as contemporary artists doing interesting things with the figure. Um, and one thing I've noticed is that, um, so, you know, th this is, artists who want to bring in sort of previously marginalized groups, so like um, black artists, are a, a lot of the current contemporary black artists, that, like Amy Sherald, who did um, Michelle Obama's portrait, or Kehinde Wiley, who did Barack Obama's portrait, they are doing just fully representational figurative art. Um, and, and then also a lot of um, Latino artists, similar. And, and that's an interesting phenomenon because for them, so wanting to make yourself present in art, it has to be figurative. Um, and that, I, I've, I've been very interested in that movement in contemporary art. But even apart from that, um, I think abstraction is now, there's, there's, a lot, there's been a huge critique of how the strand of abstraction, the idea of the avant-garde just took over art history. And so when you go to a museum, that's what you see. But all along, there were other artists doing other things. They just weren't in the museums, you know, and that took over. So I think people are also bringing back, you know, like we, I did the seminar last night for the John Paul II Institute on Edward Hopper. Well, there was a lot of debate about Hopper in his time, especially in the 30s, because he was too realistic. So was he a modern artist? And now we look back on him and can see, yes, he was a modern artist. He was doing very modern things, but he wasn't doing abstraction. So there's, there is a critique of this sort of dominance of abstraction that, that I find heartening. I, 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 don't, I don't have a problem with abstract art. I, I love a lot of abstract art. I love Kandinsky. I even love Jackson Pollock. <laughs> I, like, I like everything. There's something interesting about everything. But um, the dominance of it and the idea that you, you can't be successful if you, if you still have the figure it, it was, was always a problem. Yeah, one thing I find uh, the the need to rescue the word abstraction because all yeah. art is abstract. Yeah, <laughs> there is a, yeah. From, from my experience as an artist, there is informed abstraction and uninformed abstraction, and I think it's there's a really deep need for informed abstraction, in particular, like for if for the body to understand anatomy, so as to be able to understand it as a grammar, so as to be able to abstract from that grammar to speak about deeper realities, which we've just seen. Mm -hmm. there, there are very few artists who have that capacity, and that lies in drawing. Well, I loved, I loved, um, I absolutely loved that Picasso drawing I showed you w with the, the visitation, the meeting scene. The drawing for that is stunning. And it also reveals what an incredible draftsman Picasso was, which, which I knew, but not everybody knows that. They look at a cubist painting, and you know the common thing to say is, you know, I could do that, or anybody could do that. No, no, <laughs> not true. He's abstracting from this point of um, being, being an incredible figurative artist and intentionally doing different things with that. But y there has to be this grounding in the figure. That's true. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I love the points that you made about the spiritualization of the person in the um, in El Greco's art, and I wanted to follow up on that in the in his Laocon. So, what do you make of the fact that uh, there seems to be this spiritualization up of the human person, but then with the gods, if indeed gods they are, uh, there doesn't seem to be much distinction between the human and the divine figures in that picture. What how should we be understanding that? It's hard to understand it since we don't really know who they are. They are, pro I mean, my, what I think is they're probably um, Athena and either Poseidon or Apollo, but there have been theories that it's Adam and Eve, it's, there's all kinds of theories about them. I would say they are different. They aren't, they aren't, they're very static 
and indifferent, which I think expresses well the Greek gods. <laughs> the Greek gods are pretty indifferent to and actually harmful to humans. Um, so that, that would be, I don't know if that's an adequate answer, but they, they, they do not, they are very different from the other figures, which are expressive and emotional. And um, in this period, all of El Greco's figures are elongated. So just the fact that they're elongated doesn't tell you that much. But um, they're, they're graceful, they're static, they're almost transparent, but again, are they even complete? It's, it, you know, there's art, histor art historical issues with it that you know, we can't give a complete answer. But I, I, I see them as, as different, and to me, I, I look at them as, in, and one is even looking away. How can you look away from, what's <laughs> from that scene? And also, they're up on the ledge. Um, and, and the snakes, if you remember, you know, crawled up to the sanctuary of Minerva. And um, I, I, I think they're, they're gods looking down on the scene from the ledge. But I don't know that for sure. Another question? Yes. Um, <clears throat> so it's interesting to think about, um, I guess, the way in which there's continuity and discontinuity. Obviously, it seems like sort of a, a realism versus a, I guess, a more expressive um, interpretation of the human figure sort of prevails back and forth through history. But I also think about like an interpretation of what's happening in modernity as sort of a, in, in light of the introductory remarks, a sort of gradual losing of the figure precisely because that sort of allows us allows us to express it in a spiritualized way is there i mean is there um i mean how do you what do you make of um the i guess of the sort of the continuity that happens as you go from someone like rodin into um picasso and the abstract figure is there a i mean is the is the loss of the figure something that you can see anticipated in the 19th century in that sort of movement towards that sort of a figure or is or something else happening in the dynamic between those two historical moments Thank you. Um, I might need you to like sort of pare down the question or <laughs> um, thanks Jane sorry I'm I, it might it might be partly because the lights are so glary, but I just pare that down a little and, and ask it again. Sorry. So basically, um, I mean, it, it seems like in in somebody like Rodin, somebody like Picasso, like I mean, you do have a move like like you were talking about in the discussion afterward. You have a movement towards like sort of the loss of the figure. Is right. is I, I guess it's strange because it seems like as the figure becomes, you're looking for this this form of expression in the 19th century, you're looking for this way in which the figure actually brings out these inner realities. And then suddenly in the abstract period, it seems like you, you lose it. Is there sort of like a movement out of the body that's happening there? I guess okay. that's the question. Yes. Yes. I, I understand. I would say yes. So in my talk, I talked about how Picasso, you know, the early modern period actually was a period when a lot of artists were, were looking to bring back the spiritual. And if you look at almost any of them, um, Kandinsky wrote a whole treatise called On the Spiritual in Art, in which he went into great detail about how abstraction was a way to show the spiritual. So you could take my whole talk, everything I said, and you could extend it into modern abstraction. Um, and that's, and, and, if you look at quotes from, say, you know, Mondrian, Brancusi, who in sculpture was doing very abstract geometric forms, they, they were still representational. What they say about them is that they're trying to capture the spiritual. They're trying to capture things that are abstract through abstraction. So it's very interesting. They want to reject, you know, classicism, um, and, you know, these artists like Rodin were criticized for being too classical, being too traditional um, in, in the periods in which they were working. Um, and, and, and El Greco was the opposite. El Greco looks like a modern artist, you know, in painting around late 16th century. Um, but, but there is. It's not a continuum, but I do think, 
you could do a whole branch off of this subject talking about abstraction as a way of, you know, kind of the modern attempt, you know, without a belief in the incarnation and in fact a kind of dualism thinking that to, to depict more spiritual things you have to be more abstract because the body is material. Um, it's very it's very interesting. Mondrian has interesting quotes about um, about um, you know the depicting the spirit by by negating the body. It's it's very overt, and even even an artist like uh, Pollock, Jackson Pollock, who the stereotype is you know he didn't care. He just threw paint. No no no. He was very much on a spiritual quest. He did Jungian analysis. He um, painted uh, Native American subjects. He was looking for something spiritual as well. Almost every modern artist was looking for something spiritual and, and finding it through a abstraction. Was that successful? Does that work? That's, that's up for debate. <laughs> There's somebody with a question. Can we have one more question? Hey, one more. <laughs> this is fun. <laughs> But also, we can talk. There's there's a reception with lots of food, and you know we can just <laughs> we can keep talking. <laughs> um, th thank you, and uh, thanks so much for uh, your comments and your presentation. Um, I just would be really interested in your comments on this uh, uh, kind of tra trajectory towards abstraction as it relates to liturgical art and how that had an effect on maybe like the everyday, you, you know, um, wor worshipers uh, experience. Um, and, uh, you know, I think there is maybe a development away from more abstract art now in the liturgical experience. But um, uh, one kind of quick example I can think of is, uh, I think in the Cologne Cathedral, um, in the early 2000s, there was a new stained glass window that was installed, and it was very geometrical. And Card the Cardinal Meisner, I think, at the time was very um, cri critical of that, you know, because it, there, there was no, the, the figure wasn't there. And, you know, I think you could think of that as kind of representing a, a whole critique over the late 20th century, early 21st century. So if you could just maybe comment. On, on that, I'd be another interested. huge topic. Um, <laughs> yeah, you've you've hit on a conundrum, which is a lot of liturgical art is narrative. I mean, it's about biblical stories. It's so if if there aren't figures, I mean, how do you show? And you often end up with like semi-abstract figures, but they're still figures, and they have traditional iconography, and it's not always successful. But when you were talking, I was thinking. Stained glass especially, so I'll give an example. At, at the church, the Romanesque church of Conques in central France, which is one of the great Romanesque churches in, in Europe, in France, and uh, at all, um, because of World War II, and this is true in a lot of churches, the bombings destroyed the stained glass windows, and often contemporary artists were commissioned to do the new windows, and they did contemporary windows. Marc Chagall was, is the most famous example who did the Cathedral of Reims and other places. But um, there's a wonderful artist, Pierre Soulage, who did abstract black and white stained glass windows at Conque. I think it's utterly beautiful. It's not saints, it's not representational, but it's beautiful, and you don't necessarily have to have a Bible scene everywhere. I would say that in places where you need a, a Bible scene, I, I mean, there are, there, there are places where you need representation, but there are plenty of places where, where you don't. And this is something that if you want to talk to Father Paul at the reception, because he knows contemporary sacred art and, and mod early modern sacred art, like the chapel at Vence that Matisse did, where you have kind of um, art that's both representational and abstract. And also different, so at Vence, there's a whole wall with the Stations of the Cross that are drawn out, and it's, it's modern, but it's the Stations of the Cross. But you also have abstract windows, and you have figures and um, natural forms, but that, are, but that are done in a kind of cut-out, abstract style. So I think there's room for a lot of variation, but you do get to a good point, which is 
um, sacred art, which ha which sometimes has a I, I would say it has much more than a d didactic purpose. Sometimes people reduce it to that, which is a terrible <laughs> um, reduction. But it does have a didactic pur purpose, and so you can't just eliminate figures completely. So that's a, its per own particular problem, let's say, within modernism. But there have been such beautiful modern things done, too. So. Well, I sense that there are a lot of people who would like to keep talking, and we will outside. But, let but me we're first, hungry, too. Let me, first of all, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Father Paul. You've both... You have both put us before so many beautiful things, but you've also helped us to understand them. So often, people like us who are less trained, all we can do is say, wow. But now, you've given us something of the logos of the beautiful, and, and, and we thank you for that. You've also set a very high watermark for our first public event. <laughs> so we hope to live up to that and see you again. So see you all outside. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>